This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. About a year ago, I was having a nice lunch with the head of an Asian-focused think tank. The two of us exchanged notes on a whole bunch of topics and discussed our mutual disdain for certain airports around the world. But then about two hours into the conversation, he asked me about a recent trip that I'd made to Central Asia, asking me nonchalantly, so what's going on over there? Taken back for a second, I then asked, well, surely you're reading the same reports I am. After all, it's in Asia and that's your end of the world. He looked back at me with a blank face and said, no, not really. If it's anything west of Xinjiang, then frankly, it's out of my purview. We laughed about it and moved on. But afterwards, when I left that lunch, I was still a bit taken back knowing that an Asia analyst didn't know the first thing about Central Asia. But as much as I remember that conversation well, what took me back even further was when the exact same thing happened again and again and again. With Asia analysts, with Russia analysts, with Caucasus analysts, it seemed that Central Asia, and in particular the five former Soviet Central Asian states, often seemed to slide right under people's radars. But then again, I can't be too surprised. Plenty of regions around the world do. But what I do find interesting about this one is that Central Asia is gliding under the radar for most, whilst the entire region is undergoing a massive geopolitical, economic, and political shift. Even when you scratch just below the surface and look at each republic, well, Kazakhstan now has a leader who was one of the only ones left standing after an uprising in 2022, and now walks a very tight tightrope, balancing between Russia, the security services, the Kazakh oligarchs, and the Kazakh people looking for democratic reforms. Kyrgyzstan, the once island of democracy within Central Asia, currently has a strong man running the country, one who has sprung from jail to then walk into the parliament and threaten enough people with violence to end up being made the president of Kyrgyzstan. Just south of that, Uzbekistan is reeling from their own uprising in the west, and the population is coming to terms with a leader who on one hand writes things like press freedom and anti-discrimination laws into the constitution, whilst on the other resetting his term limits allowing himself a path to rule the country from now until nearly 2040. Just south of that, things are wildly spiraling out of control in Uzbekistan's neighbour, Tajikistan, with the country quickly tumbling down the Freedom Index, with the economy not too far behind it. Or whilst the president, the only one the country's ever had, is now deciding which child to anoint as his successor. And lastly, Turkmenistan, who, as daft as it sounds, is now below North Korea on the Freedom Index. This is a nation less free than North Korea that is currently attempting and then backflipping on a presidential transition of power, further ratcheting the tensions that have been building up in this country for a while now. The entire Central Asian region is absolutely wild at the moment, and the tempo of events are only speeding up as sanctions on Russia can continue to cause pain and problems throughout their economies. So to prevent Central Asia from continuing to glide under most people's radar, we put together a five-part crash course on the politics of the five Central Asian republics. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan, as well as the five Central Asian leaders, Qasem Jumot Tokayev, Sergei Japarov, Shavkat Mirziyoyev, Emomali Rahmon, and Sadar Berdi Mohamedov. As much as people may not realize it, this region holds the trade gateways for China, the international support for Russia, the cultural outreach for Turkey, the desperately needed hydrocarbons for South Asia, and a brand new market for the West. And realizing this potential, we should probably be following the reality TV drama currently unfolding in the center of the Eurasian landmass. So, to get up to speed and take us through the current situation in Kazakhstan, the geographically and economically largest of the Central Asian Five, we turn to our first guest. Part 1 Succeeding Through Stalemate. When we look at the overview, the arc of the last 30 years, we see very few bright spots. Having said that, the flavors of the countries are all different. And we have seen some moves from certain types of authoritarian rule to different types of authoritarian rules. Alexander Cooley is the Clareto Professor of Political Science and Vice Provost for Academic Centers and Libraries at Barnard College, part of Columbia University, as well as the Academic Adjunct and Faculty Member at Chatham House. He also served as the 15th director of Columbia University's Harriman Institute for the study of Russia, Eurasia, and Eastern Europe, and is the author and editor of eight academic books, including Dictators Without Borders, Power and Money in Central Asia, which personally was one of my previous books of the year, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. 
So the big change in Kazakhstan was this inheritance of mineral wealth from the Soviet era. And Nazarbayev's attempt to use this mineral wealth, especially oil wealth, and to pick up on late Soviet era contacts that were made with companies like Chevron and channel those into becoming a basis for sort of sovereign independence. And that's what the 90s are about. It's creating this bedrock for state building development and personal enrichment, as it turned out. And so the 90s was all about getting to these big mega oil deals with the West over these massive fields in Kashagan that enriched him and, and members of the ruling family. At the same time, Nazarbayev was really savvy talking about the need for sort of patience, for gradual independence, for modernization above everything else. And again, projecting this image of openness, that Kazakhstan was open to investment, it was open to the world, and so forth. So it didn't have the hard-edged teeth of a counterpart like in Uzbekistan. So I think that's the first stage. The second important turning point is 9-11 for the entire region. 9-11 is when you see the West and the United States in particular engage with all of the Central Asian states, more Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan than Kazakhstan, but also Kazakhstan, and try and cement their alliance and partnership in the war on terror. And so practically this meant basing rights for U.S. forces in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, but also overflight rights amongst all the Central Asian states, cooperation and in regional initiatives, attempts to link Afghanistan to Central Asia itself. And then in turn, this triggers counter-regional moves by Russia and China that are really concerned about the U.S. and the West in the region. And then I would say the third big marker after 9-11 in the region, sort of democratization, Kazakhstan included, are the sort of so-called color revolutions of the mid-2000s, right? So these are regimes at uh, see street protests on days of national elections, and that collapse as a result. So we have in Georgia, the Rose Revolution, 2003, Ukraine, the Orange Revolution, 2004, and in Kyrgyzstan, right, the Tulip Revolution of 2005. But the effects of these revolutions were felt really prominently throughout the region, Kazakhstan included. And the color revolutions is when this whole apparatus of Western democracy promotion, and by this I mean NGOs, election monitors, even the OSCEs, human rights and democracy initiatives, all these become threatening to these regimes. They're no longer just political annoyances. They are actual security threats, and they're treated as such. So Kazakhstan, who gained their independence in 1991, has only seen two leaders that entire time, a trend that will strangely continue throughout much of this episode. But of the period of the country's independence, the vast majority of it has been spent being ruled by one man, the man who was also in charge during the end of the USSR, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev who officially ruled the country from 1989 to 2019, during which time he amassed a huge net wealth for both himself and his family and became one of the most powerful leaders in the region, all whilst talking about opening the country up and bringing Kazakhstan forward to the rest of the world, even claiming to open up democratic freedoms by having elections in the country. But how much of this rhetoric actually resembled the reality in Kazakhstan during Nasarbayev's period of rule from 1989 to 2019? The story of Kazakh state building is on one level successful in terms of image crafting, the ability to build a state and a new capital in a previous sort of swampland to create this impression of dynamism and a global actor that's almost removed from Central Asia itself. This is where Nazarbayev was headed in some ways. But I think with that starts to come unharnessed hubris. I would say after two decades in power, you really do lose touch with everything. You've gone through multiple rounds where political opponents have fled. They're abroad. You become obsessed with rumor and intrigue about what's around the corner or who your enemies might be. And you start believing your own glorious contribution to your nation building history. And so just to give you one example, Nazarbayev actually renames this capital city that essentially he founded 
Astana and renames it to Nur Sultan. And I think for many, this was one of the last straws, this sort of indication of real kind of hubris. Eventually, though, protests built up against his rule. And in 2019, things began to boil over in the country. And so, seeing the writing on the wall, Nazarbayev resigned from the presidency and appointed Qasem Jomut Tokayev, the current president, to be his successor. And whilst Nazarbayev did resign from the presidency, on the way out the door, he gave himself the role of Elbasi, which roughly translated would mean something like father of the nation. And this title gave him a number of benefits, including protection from all prosecution past, present or future, allowing his family members to maintain their positions of power within the government and large state organizations. And Nazarbayev still sat at the head of the country's main economic and security committees. He even persuaded the legislature in Kazakhstan to rename the Kazakh capital from Astana to Nur Sultan to honor him. The equivalent of Trump leaving the White House and renaming Washington DC to Donald. And because all of this was still happening, Tokayev gained a reputation as Nazarbayev's puppet. And now fast forward to the 2nd of January 2022, where after power failures throughout the country, a very cold winter, costs of living rising, and corruption scandals breaking quite regularly, the Kazakh government decided to end its price caps on LPG and fuel, meaning the price of gas doubled overnight, exploding the cost of living crisis throughout the country. In response, most of the major cities across the country broke out into nationwide protests, with people storming government buildings and tearing down statues, at which point most ministers in the government were either resigning by themselves, often to flee the country, or being fired by the Kiev to try and quell the riots, but nothing worked. Then on January 6th, four days later, CSTO forces from five nations were deployed into the major cities of Kazakhstan to regain the control of the streets and end the riots. The riots were quelled, and in the end, Tokayev was one of the only members of government still standing, with him now being tasked to build a new Kazakh administration for the ground up. But it leaves him in a tough spot. On one hand, he needs to appease the reformers and the people looking for change in the country, and he is trying to do so by removing things like Nazarbayev's titles, not being as friendly with Russia as Nazarbayev was, seizing some of the stolen money that Nazarbayev's family took, and trying to reform some parts of the electoral system. But on the other hand, he also can't pull too far away from Russia or the old guard, as he may need them in the future in the event of another wave of riots kicking off across the country. Tokayev has now been president since 2019, and to be fair, has been ruling without al on these councils since 2022, going on to win an election and push through constitutional reforms. But how likely do you think it is that he'll be able to shake off this label that hangs over him of being Nazarbayev's personal appointment? The question of his own transition is a much more subtle one. And his relationship with current President Takayev and what was expected. Takayev himself was an insider, knew Nazarbayev very well. And so I think he was entrusted by Nazarbayev to ensure that Nazarbayev and the family would hold on to their positions of privilege and power. It hasn't quite worked out that way. What you've seen is a kind of a steady denazarbayevification, as I like to call it, of the country over the last four years, and especially some of these symbolic acts. So the capital has gone back now to Astana, away from Nur Sultan, in terms of its naming. And you've seen prominent members of Nazarbayev's family and extended family have their uh, business holdings taken away from them. We see a lot of the family themselves are choosing to live in exile. But the big problem that Takayev faces is that to have a pact, you need to know exactly what the previous regime did. And just to be blunt about it, how much did they steal? How much did they take? And that is unknown. And it's unknown because for decades, Nazarbayev and his family members stowed away tens of billions of dollars throughout the West in bank accounts, real estate holdings, all burnished by this very kind of clever image crafting. In 2022, with these protests, when they come to a head with these increased energy prices, people take to the streets and along with demanding more livable conditions and sort of cheap energy, you also hear the time to get out, old man. This backlash against the Nazarbayev era where those who control lucrative state assets in energy or the sovereign wealth fund or minerals or uraniums who seem to be getting rich. And so these protests, some have likened them to an Arab Spring type protests. Russia actually intervened for the very first time 
under the auspices of the Collective Security Treaty Organization and helped to quell some of the protests and guarded some of the symbolic areas. And But it was viewed as a real turning point. If it hadn't been for the Ukraine conflict, I think we'd be talking about Kazakh politics more now. So Dekayev hasn't brought much change to Kazakhstan's overarching strategic policy. But what about domestically? Has he been able to start a fresh chapter for the country after Nazarbayev? Or is he still having strings pulled behind the scenes? I think the family overestimated him, as it turned out. He was willing to go further along than they thought he would. Certainly, Nazarbayev thought he'd be calling the shots afterwards. He'd preserve some of the ceremonial positions and perks and so forth. But then you saw Takayev strip away through legislation some of the protections on investigations and prosecutions of Nazarbayev, of family members. So to him, this was a means of getting more popular legitimization for his project. At the same time, it's not as if we have genuine opposition parties in Kazakhstan. We see the tightening against public protests, against public demonstrations. We see civil society continue to be embattled. So whatever promises were made were not kept by Takayev. At the same time, he has chastised and humbled and brought down Nazarbayev, but he hasn't jailed him. And that's, I think, the critical distinction that, you know, this is a kind of a Spain-like situation where you want to demystify and separate out the country from the legacy of its presidency, but you don't want to completely stigmatize and jail or try the former president. And that's where he's at. But certainly, I think Nazarbayev would have thought he had a lot more leeway than he is now. But Takayev's challenges are real. And... I think now that Kazakh civil society has been activated, and now that we're increasingly in this kind of post-COVID era, these demands and these expectations are not going to go away. So I do think that you will have some political volatility in Kazakhstan coming up. So in 2022, we saw Vladimir Putin and President Dekayev on stage together at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. Dekayev would give a speech sitting right next to Putin, stating that Kazakhstan would not recognize any of Russia's territorial gains in Ukraine and would not push in Kazakhstan's troops to join the war. Many in the Western press took this as Tokayev standing up to President Putin and beginning the breakaway from Russia, but others would point out that in policy terms, not much really changed for Kazakh foreign policy. But where do you think the reality lies here? Understandably, perhaps, we made too much of this speech in the West and we took it out of context. This speech was covered as Nazarbayev criticizing Putin. But in fact, Tokayev's comments were in a long line about the consistency of Kazakh foreign policy and refusing to recognize separatist entities without UN approval. And so in the same speech, he was talking about how Kazakhstan has never recognized Kosovo or Abkhazia, and believes in international law, and it won't recognize the the Donetsk or Luhansk People's Republics. That's not the same thing as condemning Russia. At no point did he condemn Russia for its invasion. At no point did he actually criticize Putin for the war. And in fact, opinion polls taken in Kazakhstan show a pretty even split on who's to blame for the war. You have seen some anti-war protests allowed and some anti-war protests denied. The humanitarian assistance that was sent to Ukraine on behalf of Kazakhstan actually came from Kazakh civil society. It didn't come from the government. So there's a lot of nuances to sort of Kazakhstan's position on the war. But I would say here's the main one. They don't want to be forced to choose sides. This is why they regularly abstain at the UN and on any votes regarding the war. They absolutely despise the sanctions. They find themselves trapped by a sanctions regime in Iran, which means they can't export out of there, like India can, because it has a waiver. Previously, there were also sanctions on companies dealing with Xinjiang. So that's an entire set of networks also gone down. And now they're hit with anti-Russian sanctions. And Kazakh officials, to me, after the war started, they were absolutely furious about this. They didn't really express solidarity with Ukraine or anything like that. They were concerned about the economic impact of being a landlocked country. And now you're seeing accusations that Kazakhstan is enabling sanctions evasion through the re-export to Russia that's enabled by a joint customs union that they have. 
To me, this is hardly surprising. It seems inevitable. But the war itself is really politically fraught. And I think Kazakhstan, more than even all the other Central Asian states, wants to avoid perceptions that somehow it's siding with one side or the other. To put it mildly, Takayev has always been very foreign policy focused, with Takayev even being the former Secretary General of the UN and the former Foreign Secretary and the Chair of the Security Council for Kazakhstan, and still speaks fluent Kazakh, Russian, Mandarin, French, and English. And there's rarely a regional summit that goes by that Takayev doesn't make an appearance at. From an outsider's perspective, he often seems to be looking to position himself as the international spokesman for the Central Asian Five, putting forward the importance of both Kazakhstan as well as himself personally. Do you think he wants to use his background in foreign policy to position himself as this hinge between the Central Asian Five and nations like Russia, China, the US, or even groups like the EU? I'll add even one more position for you, which was he was actually based in Beijing for the final years of the Soviet collapse. And he saw the Soviet collapse in China. So it's no surprise that he's just come out of this summit with China with guarantees and promises of, I think, $20 billion worth of trade and investment from China. He's really done his best to nurture and encourage that strategic partner and relationship. For him, there is a genuine regional agenda, and that is regional integration from below. What do I mean by that? For the last two decades, it's only been the external powers who have tried to put pressure on the individual Central Asian regimes to cooperate and integrate. There's like an American-run plan, a Chinese-run plan, a Russian-run plan, an EU plan, but this is always sort of from above. You very rarely had integration from below. You see with Takayev a willingness to cooperate, especially with Uzbekistan and Mirza Yoyev. And to me, this is significant. Now you're starting to see this appetite. And, and I think a realization that the region itself, their own independence and sovereignty would be much strengthened through more connectivity and ties. And that would offer them the opportunity to be able to stand firm in this really tough neighborhood where they're surrounded by Russia, China, and a number of countries that want to lean into them. Because of US sanctions on Iran and a lack of infrastructure throughout Afghanistan, most of the Central Asian states have to export their goods northward through Kazakhstan to reach the Russian, Chinese, or European markets. Does this give Kazakhstan or Takayev a hefty amount of leverage when it comes to politicking with the other Central Asian states? Or does China's fabled Silk Road 2.0 negate these issues? It definitely holds a lot of trading corridors and transit corridors. It's not at all clear that the sort of overland trade is going to be the hedge against Russia that some thought it might be, potentially. I think what you see is a country trying to make the most of the different arrangements that it has. Maybe some don't like to be reminded of this, but Kazakhstan's greatest trading partner last year was Russia. And, you know, you saw trade pick up with Russia again. You saw exiled IT workers and those fleeing conscription in en masse across the border to Kazakhstan. Some fled and went elsewhere. Some have stayed, though. You see a place like Astana has now become a budding IT hub from these displaced sort of Kazakh workers. And then you see a really vibrant re-export trade. And we know this through sort of some of the data that's been released, where EU and US and South Korean trade with Kazakhstan is up massively year over year. The suspicion is that Kazakhstan is being used as an intermediary for sensitive materials or even sanctioned materials to go into Russia. So there's a lot of different dimensions to this. There's a global dimension with Kazakhstan wants to be a player. There is this really important sort of Chinese vector, which includes the trans-Eurasian kind of trade you were describing. But there is also this kind of post-sanctions kind of set of networks that we're seeing now develop. And all of these, I think, are, are contributing to the sort of complexity of these Kazakh economic networks. With this increasingly complicating region, though, can Kazakhstan or Tokayev maintain the control over the Kazakh state without massive democratic reforms, with the overall hope of preventing another 2022-style uprising in the country, as Russia may not have the troops to save them a second time? 
In some ways, Takayev's mission is even more difficult now because with Nazarbayev, the Western excuse, calculation, but also excuse, was, well, yeah, at least he keeps a steady ship. It's not a basket case of protests and regime changes the way you have in Kyrgyzstan. It's not dangerous the way it is in Tajikistan. And it's not like North Korea level clothes the way it is in Turkmenistan. Takayev now is dealing not only with a transition and a set of expectations, but an activated and immobilized civil society. I don't think Takayev has many democratic bones in his body. But the fact that you will see continued pressure on accountability on some of these sort of social and economic issues, I think is really going to put his regime to the test. So Kazakhstan is being ruled by a leader with a legitimacy crisis hanging above his head, one who will forever be accused of only being given the job because of his loyalty to Nazarbayev, but one who, despite all this, is starting to slowly implement some mild reforms in the region. The press has become mildly more free, some political protests are slowly opening up, and in the recent elections, we saw the first independent legislators enter the parliament in multiple decades. We're even seeing some of Astana's powers being divulged to the state governments, and much of the executive powers that were concentrated under Nazarbayev being given back to the legislature. But it's still a long way to go. It's a dim, bright spot, but it's still a bright spot, pointed in the right direction. Unlike its southern neighbour, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan was long held as the bastion of freedom in Central Asia, a country who elected a physicist to be their first leader, as opposed to the standard party apparatchiks that seized power in the other four republics at the end of the Soviet Union. Kyrgyzstan has for a long time been the most democratic of the five, with somewhat competitive elections, an open press, and a thriving banking sector that boosted their economy. But the country just saw its third revolution since independence, and through it, watched a strong man, Sadir Japarov, come to power, one willing to use his newfound power to directly bend and distort the democratic institutions that had strengthened Kyrgyzstan in the first place. But when you're asking if this is the establishment of a new trend for Kyrgyzstan, are the Kyrgyz doomed to join the other four Central Asian states in authoritarianism, or will the democratic backbone the country is so famous for remove Japarov through protests like they've done with all of the other Kyrgyz presidents who've attempted to dictate themselves over the country? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. The Contentious Khan Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan today remain the most three Central Asian countries, but it's not because the leaders at the top make them. It's because the societies were able to learn how to navigate limited political freedoms. Erika Murat is an associate professor and chair of the Regional and Analytical Studies Department at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., she also previously directed the Homeland Defense Fellowship Program at CISA and for many years has been a prolific writer on the political affairs of her home country, Kyrgyzstan. Erika's research primarily focusing on the violence, mobilization, and security institutions in Eurasia, India, and Mexico. On top of this, she also authored three books, including most recently, The Politics of Police Reform, Societies Against the State in Post-Soviet Countries. And we're thrilled to have her back on the program today we do see vibrant civil society emerging. Kyrgyzstan has seen at least three changes of regime that resulted from mass mobilization, protests, sometimes just in the city, in the capital city, Bishkek, and sometimes all across the nation. This has been the pattern because of lack of representation of the diverse composition of Kyrgyzstan society at the top and a lack of robust procedures and institutions. Can you take us through the juxtaposed position where Kyrgyzstan has a strong pluralistic parliament, one elected by somewhat comparatively fair elections, but at the same time also currently has a strong man ruling over the country? Can you take us through Kyrgyzstan's system? Kyrgyzstan is an interesting case because there is political pluralism. Elections tend to be competitive. But whoever rises uh, to the top, the past presidents, they like to move on from that political pluralism and centralize power in their hands. 
And once they do that, they're, they're successful for some period of time. For instance, Bakiev, the president who ruled from 2005 to 2010 and was ousted in the bloody uprising, and then Adam Bayev, and later Jane Bekov, they came to power as a result of somewhat competitive political pluralistic process. But then they tried to centralize power. And again, the same pattern we see today. But the question is, how long will he be able to push the limits? At what point will he be ousted if he continues to be so autocratic? The person we're alluding to here is Sadia Japarov, the current president of Kyrgyzstan, a man who was sprung from jail during the 2020 protest and pounced on the chaos, who would use the chaos to stand on the floor of parliament threatening violence against others if they didn't make him the interim president to oversee the transition after what he alleged to be a fraudulent election, and ignoring the current constitution, was actually made the interim president. But once given this role, he managed to change the system and shift some of the legislature's power towards a newly created loyal branch of government known as the People's Cruel Thai, that he would then use to skew the upcoming elections in his favour, carrying from an interim president to oversee a transition to becoming the country's elected president. It's a pretty wild story. So can you take us through how someone goes from prisoner to president in such a short time. It all happened within about a span of 24 to 48 hours in October 2020. And it was unexpected to so many people, especially in urban areas in Bishkek, and especially to people who first came to Central Square in Bishkek after rigged parliamentary elections in October 2020. And they were demanding new elections Japarov's friend, the confidant, and currently close ally, the former police officer, Tashiev, he was able to capitalize on the chaos and lack of rule of law in Bishkek and free, forcefully free Japarov from prison. He was serving in jail time for allegations and corruption and appoint him to become the interim president to deal with the chaos that ensued after mass protests. It was a whirlwind of events, one after another, but to make a really long story short, for many in urban areas, he had quite a robust reputation among more rural population. And in the recent years, spreading those really populist messages about economic resources belonging to the people, it feels like Japarov came out of nowhere if you are someone who is based in Bishkek or outside of Kyrgyzstan. But then he really was able to speak to the sentiment that many in rural areas shared, that uh, the country is, uh, the country's resources are being stolen, embezzled, that, that we need a strong hand. We continue to be surprised by his popularity, by his ability to capitalize on his populist message and to maintain support among the active minority, despite that he has been rolling back on some of the democratic gains in Kyrgyzstan, so suppressing freedom of the media and jailing his political opponents. So Japarov continues a long tradition of the Kyrgyz presidency being held by someone from the north, after being held from someone by the south, after being held by someone from the north, after being held by someone from the south with there being some cultural and political differences between the people who live north in the cities like Bishkek and the people who live in the south in cities like Osh, and these political divides being quite vocal during the revolutions that we saw in 2005, 2010, and 2020. But outside of these revolutions, how much do you think this geographic divide between north and south plays into everyday Kyrgyz politics? So the north-south divide is there, but it only becomes important when all other options fail. But even today, Japarov himself being from northern Kyrgyzstan, he has, Ashif is from southern Kyrgyzstan, so they both share power. For the most part, whoever's at the top will try to have a quite regionally representative cabinet so that it doesn't come across just as a fully southern or fully northern cabinet. So the Kyrgyz often pride themselves on being the freest of the Central Asian region, but Japarov has been quickly consolidating power in the country. So how is the population reacting to these moves? <laughs> 
So some of his most loyal supporters would forgive many things that Chaparov does. But of course, for the majority of the population, there is only so much that any regime in Kyrgyzstan can do. And banning Azatuk, the syndicate of Radio Liberty in Kyrgyzstan, is really a bad omen for any leader in Kyrgyzstan because that's how the collapse of ruling regimes begins. I'm so puzzled how presidents of Kyrgyzstan don't really learn from each other, that there is a certain sequence of events that every one of them undertakes that results then in the collapse of the regime. It starts with soft propaganda, then it goes into limiting or banning this media outlet and then that media outlet. And when it reaches to Azatek, the media outlet that so many people in the country trust, that's almost a point of no return. That's when many in the country see that the leadership is only interested in sustaining on power and not really interested in governing. And it becomes this trigger point for people to then look for, to mobilize, basically. And I think, again, in Kyrgyzstan at this point, seeing that Japarov is repeating many of the past mistakes of the previous regimes, limiting media freedoms, jailing opponents, it's really about when and not if he'll be ousted. And it's a matter of whether it's going to happen this year and the next elections in a couple of years, we don't know that. It's very hard to predict the exact trigger points. But again, unfortunately, <laughs> we are going to see another forceful ouster of incumbent regime in Kyrgyzstan at some point. As it currently stands, do you think it's still fair to call Kyrgyzstan the island of democracy in Central Asia? In the recent media freedom rankings, Kyrgyzstan was the biggest loser I think losing about 50 points and really sliding down in its media freedom ranking. Achieving a really worse media freedom environment than a year. So Kyrgyzstan is not an island of democracy in Central Asia. I would say that there are enclaves (laughs) of democratic participation across Kyrgyzstan that are driven mostly by dynamic civil society groups as opposed to governments. So civil society groups engaging in free conversations, daring conversations, critique of the government, critique of international politics, and are able to maintain democratic participation that way. And democracy is definitely not coming top down from the current regimes anywhere in Central Asia. So Kazakhstan went from bad to slightly better, and Kyrgyzstan went from great to now only just holding onto the gold medal for regional freedom on the Freedom Index. But as dire as things seem in Kyrgyzstan, they're still far above our next nation, a nation that was once on nearly equal rankings with North Korea for freedoms, and only banned slavery in 2022 the most populous of the Central Asian republics, Uzbekistan. This country is also up to only its second president since independence, a man named Shavkat Mirziyoyev, who admittedly has opened the country up a lot since the death of his predecessor, Islam Karimov. But from a man who came into power promising to give democracy to the people, and that he would hand over power at the ballot box, ushering in a new era of Uzbek politics, he has instead just amended the constitution to allow him to rule Uzbekistan until 2040 as well as carry out crackdowns on regional areas and further tighten these strings around the Uzbek government. But when we look at Freedom House's Freedom Index rankings, Uzbekistan is one of only two of the five Central Asian republics to gain points in last year's rankings. Again, it was minimal, but it was at least pointing in the right direction. So should we put our faith in Mirziyoyev to lead Uzbekistan into a new democratic era? Or should we give up hope and accept that the standard playbook of regional ruler is setting in? and strap in for Mirziyoyev to rule Uzbekistan with an increasingly tight fist over the next 17 years. Well, to answer that, we do to our third guest. Part 3. A Traditional Tyranny The situation with democracy in Uzbekistan is not a simple trend that we can kind of draw the line and see where it's going. But at the moment, I think... What's going on in Uzbekistan doesn't look like real democratization. Timur Amarov is a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, 
with his research primarily focused on the domestic and foreign policies of the Central Asian republics, as well as China's relations with Russia and their Central Asian neighbors. A native of Uzbekistan, Timur has become one of the most respected analysts on Central Asia's domestic and foreign policies and the growing power dynamics evolving within the region, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. In the very beginning of Shavkat Mirziyoyev's presidency in 2016-17, and to a less extent in 2018, there were a lot of hopes that the new leadership after the long-term dictator Islam Karimov will eventually take a democratization as the main path for development of Uzbekistan's political system. But we already see how Mirzi Ayev got re-elected in 2021 and now rewriting constitution and staying in power for at least the nearest 14 years drives us to a conclusion that it's still too early to talk about a real democratization of uh, Uzbekistan at the moment. From the final years of the USSR through to his death in 2016, Islam Karimov ruled the country with a very tight fist with his period of leadership including time from both during the SSR and then into Uzbekistan's independence, how much actually changed during this transition to Karimov? I think Karimov changed it a lot. Of course, without the the Soviet system, Karimov invented Uzbekistan's modern political system, where in the very beginning of the 90s, we had several groups of politicians that wanted to grab power. And of course, Karimov had the upper hand here because he already controlled the system overall. The consequences of Karimov's actions in the 90s are still observed in the current Uzbekistan. And what he did back then was, first, he got rid of any politicians who were not agree with him by different excuses, blaming them Islamists and blaming them Nicolists. He eventually ended up being the only politician in the whole country. And after that, it was no longer a difficult task for him to consolidate the whole, not only power in his hands, but also narratives. So he banned all the independent media. He did crack down on the NGOs, but he still had the biggest problem. And it was the society who really wanted to see change. And I think we've seen the attempt from the people to at least try to show to the government that they don't agree in Andijan 2005, where thousands of people went to protests. So Karimov decided to very harshly crack down the protests in Andijan 2005, and then slowly close down Uzbekistan and close any alternative narratives inside Uzbekistan. I think this was the most important event that made Karimov a dictator of Uzbekistan. And until his death, Uzbekistan was a closed government, a closed country with a very narrow political alternatives promoted by those who escaped Uzbekistan and continued to talk about what's going on in the country from the outside. But with his death, tried to portray himself as someone who will change everything. But in reality, it turns out to be just an image that Mirziyoy wants to, wants everyone to believe in. But in reality, the system is still the same as Karimov built it. Mirziyoyev, the current president of Uzbekistan, was the country's prime minister under Karimov. But even though he's prime minister, many assume that Karimov's daughter, Gulnara Karimova, would take on the presidency after Karimov's death. In the end, though, it did go to the Prime Minister Merzioyev, where it remains today. So how did Merzioyev manage to secure the presidency over the president's daughter? So in a way, Karimov himself helped Merzioyev to come to power because Karimov also had a family. And this family was very powerful while Karimov was healthy and alive. Everyone knows about his eldest daughter, Gulnara Karimova, who was uh, very active, not only in political dimension, but also in business, arts. Throughout her career, she's been 
taking different governmental positions, but also being a Uzbek diva, writing and singing songs, creating her own clothes and stuff like that. She was very well known inside Uzbekistan. And by the end of Karimov's regimes, Gulnara, of course, as many others around Karimov understood that her father is not going to be in power forever. And the moment she started to think about taking some actions to become an influential person after Karimov's gone, I think the system went against her. And there is a well-known situation when Karimov was shown of all of the corruption schemes that Gulnara was part of and Karimov was informed by the attempts of Gulnara to grab power while he was alive and of course he didn't like that and he with his own hands put her under house arrest and when he died Gulnara didn't have access to negotiations that were happening inside the political regime, inside the political elites, and that helped Mirziyoyev a lot. So how much of things like press freedom and democratic representation changed under Mirziyoyev compared to, let's say, the Karimov era? Of course, it's a huge change, but we should also understand that during the last years of Karimov's presidency, Uzbekistan was so closed and the media didn't really have freedom of maneuver so that anything, any opening, even a slight one would be very visible. So this what actually happened during the first years of Mirziyoyev in power. And, and of course, people feel it. There is this feeling and, and this atmosphere of kind of controlled freedom in a way. For example, many people can go to websites of the independent media and read a lot of things about the corruption, about different political situations, political problems, or big reports about the corruption on the very high level of Uzbekistan. But at the same time, all of the independent journalists understand that there will be any information that somehow damages reputation of Mirziyoyev himself, they would have problems. I'm in contact with many independent journalists inside Uzbekistan, and there is a huge level of sense censorship. So in many cases, it's not the government who shuts them down, but it's rather themselves being cautious. Uzbekistan does have elections and opposition parties, yet most analysts will pretty easily predict the winner of any upcoming election. So you can take us through how elections work in Uzbekistan and what opposition politics looks like. Islam Karimov really destroyed any attempts to create opposition to the current political regime and Mirziyoyev just inherited the system from Karimov and keeps it very tight and very overly controlled. So even when we talk about the so-called opposition that exists today in Uzbekistan, for example, we have not only one party, but also several others. They all are represented in the parliament. But the fact that the main party that takes the majority in the parliament, Uzlidep, is led by Mirziyoyev and for sure consists of the people who are close to the narrow circle of the administration of president. But we also have other parties, for example, like Tiklanish, and this is a rather nationalistic party that sometimes promotes different narratives that doesn't look like a pro-government or sometimes criticizes how different spheres are run by the current government. But they never criticize the system, they never criticize the president. And actually, after Shavkat Mirziyoyev recently announced a snap presidential election, the head of Militik Lanish, the so-called opposition party, supported Mirziyoyev's candidacy to the election. So the system consists of fake opposition to portray Uzbekistan as a real working democratic government, but in reality, it's of course not. The previous two countries you've discussed on this episode are both part of Russian security treaties like the CSTO and Russian-led economic treaties like the EEU. Yet Uzbekistan is a member of neither. Do you think this tells us that Uzbekistan is completely independent of Russia 
Or do you think there's still a lot of lingering Russian influence throughout Uzbekistan's politics even today? On the surface, it looks like Uzbekistan isn't so closely tied with Russia. For example, Uzbekistan is not the part of Collective Security Treaty Organization. It's not a part of Eurasian Economic Union. Those integrational projects that are led by Russia and portrayed as kind of Russia's sphere of influence portrayed by the Kremlin. But in reality, Russia is still very important for Uzbekistan's political regime. And the ties that exist between the political elites are rather informal than formal. For example, with the Mirziyoyev's election in, in 2016, we've seen how different Russian oligarchs and people that are closely connected with the Kremlin have been becoming more and more influential inside Uzbekistan. For example, Alashar Usmanov, Uzbek-born Russian oligarch. Since 2016, his presence in Uzbekistan and his business interests in Uzbekistan have grown dramatically. And there is also known that the fact that Mirziyoyev and Usmanov are long-term friends and have close informal ties with each other. So it could be said that Russia uses informal bridges to get closer to the political elites in Uzbekistan. And the fact that Uzbekistan isn't formally part of these Russian unions and organizations doesn't mean that in reality it is kind of the same level of connections. And Tashkent really cares about its relations with Moscow. At the end of the day, the main goal of the current political regime is to stay in power as long as possible. And if something happens, the plan B for them would be to go to Moscow to call for help. It happened in Kazakhstan in January 2022. So the question I think everyone in Uzbekistan is asking at the moment, particularly after these constitutional reforms that would enable Mirziyoyev to serve till nearly 2040. Is Mirziyoyev Karimov 2.0 or is he something completely different? I wouldn't say that Mirziyoyev is Karimov 2.0 because many things are different right now. And Mirziyoyev has to, on the one hand, be more flexible with other political elites that exist in Uzbekistan. For example, the influential business people who control Uzbekistan's monopolies or the growing Uzbekistan's religious political circles. And I'm not even talking about those who are the part of Siloviki, the part of security structures. And unlike Karimov, Mirziyoyev has to be ready to negotiate and ready to give something back to those other groups of political elites that they want. On the other hand, Mirziyoyev also has problems with the society of Uzbekistan. So what of any authoritarian regime would want their society to do is to just be completely silent, not to be interested with politics and just, you know, produce things that are needed for GDP growth. That's it. But what happened with and its relations with society is that in the very beginning of his presidency, he promised a lot to the people of Uzbekistan. And the main basis of Mirziyoyev's popularity in Uzbekistan is hopes for a better future that were given by Mirziyoyev himself. And when people do not see the results of Mirziyoyev's presidency, they are being more and more upset with the current situation in the country. And we've seen that people see protests as an effective tool into making government keep up to their promises. For example, the massive protests in Kharkov, Pakistan last summer were very political and people showed to the current political regime of Uzbekistan that the promises that they were given are not ignored by the people and they want to see a real change in, in Uzbekistan. And this is only possible if the current political regime would share the access to power to a broader population and not to keep just in a very tiny circle of people. Mirziyoyev doesn't look to be the saviour that many were hoping for, and people should feel right, feel disappointed at the lack of serious reform in the country. But there is something to be said for the steps forward that Mirziyoyev has taken, like ending slavery, the expansion of private ownership, 
and his somewhat restraint over the recent uprisings in the western region of Karakal, Pakistan, which again, I don't endorse, but it does stand in contrast to his predecessor, whose actions at a similar protest would see 1,500 slaughtered in the Andajan massacre in 2005. Murazioyev at least attempted to keep the violence and deaths from spiraling out of control, unlike our next person of focus. To Uzbekistan's southeast is the nation of Tajikistan, ruled since 1992 by Emomali Rahman, or Rachmaninoff before he changed his name to sound less Russian. Rachman back in the early 90s secured Russian backing to win the bloody Tajik civil war in 1994, and then subsequently punishing his enemies and filling all of the country's positions of power with loyalists and family members, shaping the future institutions and direction of the republic to his personal will. And now, almost 30 years later, we see a nation who's instituted brutal crackdowns at its eastern autonomous oblast of Gornobarakshan, has been at war with almost all of its neighbors at some point in time, and boasts of an economy where almost 40% of it comes from the remittances of Tajik workers doing menial work in Russia and sending what's left over from their paycheck back to Tajikistan. But how did we get here? Why haven't we seen these same sort of political uprisings like in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan pop up here in Tajikistan? And how will the country handle the upcoming transition away from the only national leader they've ever known? Well, to answer that, we turn to our fourth guest. Part 4. The Eternal Executive Tajikistan continues to break records in the levels of repression that we have seen emerging in recent years. We shouldn't compare, but in many ways, Tajikistan looks more and more like Turkmenistan, the reclusive, closed, incredibly repressive country that Turkmenistan is. Tajikistan is getting very close in many different ways, in the numbers of political prisoners that it has, which are now certainly over a thousand, but we know of hundreds of them. In general, the way the country is run in its kleptocratic fashion, it really breaks records, continues to drop in terms of its democracy rankings as per Freedom House. I'd say that Tajikistan is in a deep, deep human rights crisis and is really on par with the worst of the worst. Steve Swerdlow is an associate professor of the practice of human rights in the Department of Political and International Relations at the University of Southern California. A human rights lawyer specializing in the former Soviet states, Steve is a senior Central Asia researcher at Human Rights Watch, heading the organization's work on Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and founding its Kyrgyzstan field office. Steve has worked as a consultant for the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, the United Nations Development Program, and the International Labor Organization. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. He's been in power for over 30 years, so it even puts him ahead of Alexander Lukashenko for the longest running autocrats of the post-Soviet space. He can call himself the elder statesman among the five autocratic presidents of Central Asia. What do we know about him? Well, we know that he began his career as a collective farm head, and that endeared him to many people, that he was not from the elite. So when Rahman was chosen for this position as the civil war was breaking out in 1992, he was seen in a way as a refreshing alternative, as a man of the people in some respects. Of course, collective farm heads, it's still a prestigious and powerful position, but it was different than what Soviet Tajikistan had seen previously. So he represented something new. Over the years, as he has consolidated his authoritarian grip on power, it's often been stated by many in Dushanbe and other parts of the country that what Rahmon has brought with him is not just kleptocracy, it's not just dynastic succession, it's not just a family-run kleptocratic regime, but there's also regionalism at play. So a lot of major players, enforcers, field commanders, tough guys that Rahmon has relied on and used have come from the Kulob region, or more precisely his city of Dangara. And you'll, you'll often hear in various parts of Tajikistan that the southern clan or that the southern region has been allowed to really become dominant in the rest of the country. So Tajikistan does actually have elections, with Rahman winning 92% in 2020, 83% in 2013, and 80% in 2006. And traveling through Tajikistan, a lot of people bring this up when they're asked about how democratic the nation is. But can you take us through how elections work here in Tajikistan and what sort of opposition Rahman's up against? There's never been an election in Tajikistan that has been deemed free or fair. 
by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And one by one, since the end of the Civil War, which ended in a peace agreement in 1997, that basically stated that 30% of government posts should be allocated to members of the United Tajik opposition, which was made up of by Islamists and also liberal Democrats and members of ethnic minority regions like Gorna Badakhshan, one by one, Rahmon has walked back on the guarantees of that peace agreement and he has eliminated through violence or through politically motivated charges anyone standing in his way. And that in 2010, the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, which was albeit a very modest opposition, I mean, when I say modest, out of about 70 seats in parliament, the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, which was a democratically oriented Islamist opposition party, they had two seats, they had two seats in parliament. So that's a very modest opposition, but they did very, very, very well in the 2010 parliamentary elections. And when Rahmon saw that this party, which the party stated had up to 40,000 members, may have actually, in reality, won those parliamentary elections, that really scared him. And that really caused him to crack down really hard on this party. And he eventually disbanded it, declared the members all to be extremists, accused them of plotting a coup to overthrow him in 2015. And we got another major slide into the repressive Tajikistan we know today. And how did Rahman actually get away with all this? What Rahman has done is rewritten history. He has an official title that all state media and journalists are required to address him by, which includes guarantor of peace and some other things in his long title. But essentially, he's built his myth of governance on this idea that he is the guarantor of peace, that the opposition was actually to blame for the war, that they were really the enemies of the people, and that he is the protector of peace. And he's moved to try to completely erase the abuses of the central government all the time while moving in on various parts of the country that could potentially present opposition to him. So areas in Garm or now Gorna Badakhshan, the Islamic Renaissance Party, all of those have fallen away, including, by the way, anyone from the intelligentsia or the political opposition who, who sought to set up shop in Russia. Now, we have to mention Russia because one of the legacies of poverty and the war was that you got a huge number of migrants. It's important to recognize that part of Rahman's strategy and the way he's become more authoritarian is by partnering with Russia and asking Russia to return or extradite or even kidnap anyone that politically opposes him and, and seeks to agitate or speak about politics critical of Rahman from Russia. And they really do rely on Russia for more than just that. Russian remittances, parts of Tajik workers' paychecks that are sent back home to Tajikistan, make up around 40% of the Tajik economy, and a huge amount of Tajiks every single day travel to Russia for work. And just to give our listeners a bit of an idea on how many flights actually go from Tajikistan to Russia, when I was in Dushanbe International Airport a few months ago, the flight board at the airport had 16 flights for the day, and 12 of those went directly to Russia. So how does Rukman deal with having an economy that could fall into a complete collapse with a simple visa rule change by Moscow? It's always been a huge problem for the government. They've been forced to deal with the reality that such a large portion of the male and even female population have become migrants, that they have accommodated that in a way over the years. I mean, they've increased the number of Russian language schools dramatically. Rahman obviously maintains a very close relationship with Putin because if that spigot is cut off, it spells total disaster for his economy. He's, of course, also is allowed Putin's troops to be stationed in Tajikistan basically since the end of the civil war, which is a large contingent, maybe 70,000 troops. They ostensibly are there to guard the border from Afghanistan, but they also in a way act as, in a way, a guarantee of Rahman's rule as well. So there's much in that relationship that is both beneficial, but also threatening. It's an incredible amount of leverage that Russia has on Tajikistan, but there's also something in, in which, as you've noted, if the 3 million Tajik migrants left Russia today, the Russian economy would also be failing. You feel the Russian influence is overpowering in many ways. Economically, it's very powerful. And it also means that you have a myriad problems that you wouldn't necessarily expect. You have a whole generation of children that grow up with their grandparents instead of their parents. Rahman is not the young man he once was. And by now, he's surely thinking about the upcoming power transition, setting up for who will take the reins of the country after him. 
Now, many speculate that he's looking to his son, Rustam Imamali, to take over the leadership of the country. But in Tajikistan, there seems to be a lack of groundwork being done to set him up as the easy successor for this. So I want to get your thoughts on this. A, do you think he's thinking about the transition already? And B, who do you think he has in mind to take over his role? You know, we've talked about the power transfer for some years now. You ask any T Tajik expert and you get to this question. And the truth is nobody really can answer this question because it's it's up to Rahman and maybe it's up to Putin. And we don't quite know what we hear is that there are a number of reasons why this hasn't happened yet. Sometimes COVID is brought out as an explanation. Sometimes there's a sense that Rustam himself, either his father deemed that he wasn't ready. Certainly he has climbed the career stepway that very similar to the case of Sirdar in Turkmenistan. I mean, he's, he's now in the mayor of Dushanbe position. He edged out or he, when he filled that spot, he pushed out one of the long-term companions, political allies, of Rahman, who, Ubaidullayev, who had been one of the only people left in a way that had political stature and maybe was seen in a way as a potential rival. So that was very significant when Wustram became the mayor. Before that, he had been given a plum position heading up, I think, the unit against organized crime in the state border service or the customs service. And that was also gave him a lot of power, allowed him to amass a sort of mafia within the government, a set of enforcers he could use. So he has been amassing power. He seems certainly like he's marching into that job. But there's this other problem, which is his sister, Ozoda. She happens to be the chief of the presidential administration. She's occupied many positions in the foreign ministry. And there's always been rumors that, in fact, she may be the more competent one, more ready to handle the job. Could this be a game of succession where this rivalry that Emil Mali Rahmon is still wondering who would fill that role? Perhaps. One thing we should say, though, is Emil Mali Rahmon is not well. He disappears for lengthy periods or has been more lately disappearing from the scene. And there's a lot of serious concern that his health is not well. So this may be, again, a la the Uzbekistan case, this may be a case where Things only become clear once he dies. But I think in terms of understanding politics in Tajikistan, it's more than Rustam. I think we need to look at the whole clan, their business interests, their holdings around the world, where they stash their money, in a way is more helpful than just looking at, at Rustam himself. So where is all this heading? Is Tajikistan being set up for some serious reforms or are they simply doubling down and things are only going to get worse? Where is this all heading? It's heading nowhere good. If we really want to change the trajectory of Tajikistan, obviously we need to look closely at where the money is coming from and think about the sources of income that the country is receiving. Obviously, a lot of that is coming from China and Russia, and we can't necessarily have an impact on that. But we can think about accountability, about smart sanctions, about things that could really change the calculus of President Rahmon, which is identifying particular individuals that are responsible for the crimes against humanity in the Pamiri region and putting them on those lists and denying those assets and freezing those assets and denying the visas. There's actually a lot that a lot of tools, a lot of things that can be applied to look at to respond to Tajikistan's worsening overall and very bleak picture. After three decades of rule, it seems another Rahman is set to take the throne over Tajikistan, with the choices being either his well-known hothead son, who is only just older than the country itself, or his cunning daughter, who's been jet-setting around the world for the last few years, shaking the hands of dictators, bankers, and oligarchs, gathering favors to cash in later, and no one fully aware who she owes her allegiances to. Either way, neither of them are advocates for democracy in Tajikistan. But as Steve alluded to, one of the main reasons that Rahman may not have already carried out this transition might be because of what happened recently in neighboring Turkmenistan, where a similar situation unfolded. The second country's president, Gurbanguly Berdi Muhammadov, would just last year hand over the presidency of the country to his son, Sadar Berdi Muhammadov. Sadar was also hand-groomed by his father and is only just a little older than Rahman's son. But just a few months into the presidency, his father stepped back in and seized many of the levers of power and effectively cut all the legitimacy out of his presidency, even raising even more questions about the Turkmen leadership change. Why would he go through with this? What was the point in taking the power back? And if he thinks his son can't handle the job, then who can? 
And again, none of this is that outlandish because it is Turkmenistan. This is a country that sits near the bottom of the global freedom rankings, ranking well below Tajikistan, below the DRC, and even beneath North Korea. It is one of the most repressive regimes, as our next guest will cover. But whether it's the gold statues of the president, the sprawling capital city made of marble, or the first president renaming the months of the year to his mother's name and his dog's names, all of the issues we've put forward here today across the five Central Asian states in Turkmenistan are taken to the extreme. Whether it be press freedom, freedom of speech, police brutality, and international crackdowns, Turkmenistan will always top the list. And to take us through just how confuddling this state is, we turn to our final guest. Part 5. Dynastic Despotism Afghanistan is really rock bottom. It's been an example of authoritarianism on steroids. All the other Central Asian states look good by comparison with Turkmenistan, and that's that's been true pretty much since not long after independence. They don't have any kinds of freedoms. There are no opposition parties. You can't criticize the government publicly, e even if you're yelling against somebody the official in the store. That's enough to get you in a lot of trouble, let alone trying to hold demonstrations, rallies, anything like that. Bruce Panier is the host of Radio Liberty's Majorly's podcast, focusing on the politics of Central Asia, and a prolific journalist that has been covering the Central Asian region now for decades. He is easily one of the most cited writers on the international machinations of Central Asian politics, and one of my favorite guests to have you on the program. So we're thrilled to have him back on the show. There is no independent media in the country. You can be imprisoned at a closed door trial on trumped up charges. It happens all the time. No, it's a very opaque process because they let hardly any foreigners into the country. But enough people have told the same story or similar stories that you, you can understand that it's a completely authoritarian state with a security force that it is probably the most capable body in the country because it is tasked with keeping the president in power. It does, has done a fairly thorough job throughout its history in Turkmenistan. As I said, any government opponent is dealt with very quickly. They don't uphold the rights of ethnic minorities. And in the meantime, government leans on the people to help balance the economy. The standard of living has dropped precipitously in the last seven years. A country which is rich in natural gas now regularly features people lining up at the early hours of the morning to get bread. The unemployment rate, by some estimates, is in excess of 60% of the eligible workforce. Is this situation with high unemployment, low calorie intakes, and people attempting to flee the country in increasing numbers always been the case here in Turkmenistan, or is there a reason that it's gotten particularly bad recently? The drop in the standard of living started when the price of oil went down in 2014. So by 2016, anyway, it was real noticeable in Turkmenistan. Its major export is, of course, gas, which accounts for 80, some people say 90% of its export revenues. So when the price of gas went down, followed by the price of oil, and it, it sparked an economic crisis where they had shortages of all kinds of food. Now, this is not to say that the Turkmen government doesn't have money. I mean, they are getting money from the sales of gas. And if they were willing to let a, a slightly larger percent of that reach public spending, it would probably resolve many of the problems that the country has. But the government, especially the president, is notorious for uh, siphoning off funds. So this is part of a problem, too. But the standard of living has gone down. They used to get allotments of natural gas, electricity, and water for free. The government just let them have a certain amount every month. And that was, that was started in late 1992, early 1993. But a few years ago, they, under then-President Gurban Gulliberi Mukhamedov, they decided that the country was doing so well economically that there was no reason for them to actually keep providing this stuff for free. The real reason was that the government didn't have money that they wanted to spend on infrastructure projects or things like that that would have benefited the people. So instead, they made the people pay for it. Every time they hold an event of some kind, the people have their wages garnished or are expected to make quote-unquote voluntary contributions to whatever it is. They held the Asian indoor martial arts games a few years ago, and everyone had to contribute. So all that stuff just kind of compounds, and it leads to you know a situation where there's not enough money, there's not enough goods for most people in expensive stores you can get food, everything you want. But unfortunately, for the budgets of most people, you have to depend on subsidized goods every month, flour, cooking oil, things like that. The government was sponsoring food packages. So you got an allotment of food, at least 
until recently, but the latest reports seem to indicate that the government has quietly even shelved that plan. So low-income families that were depending on these these basics in not very large quantities to get through the month now don't even have that. So we've seen a trend throughout this episode of a country having a first really harsh dictator, usually a leftover from the USSR, who then steps down or passes away and hands the mantle off to a slightly more lenient president after that. Does this trend that we see throughout Central Asia also extend here in Turkmenistan as well. Niyazov was an orphan. His father was supposedly killed in World War II. There's various accounts of how that happened. But his mother and his brother were both killed in the earthquake in 1948. So he was raised in state orphanage, Soviet state orphanage. So when he came to power, although he had a son, they didn't seem to get along. The son didn't spend much time in Turkmenistan. So he had some people close to him that were associates, but not relatives. So Gurban Guli Berdi Mukhamedov shows up. He's got access to the same resources, but he got five sisters. So all of a sudden, the sisters, their husbands, their children, you know, started getting their own hands into the pie. It, it's really interesting how Turkmenistan and Tajikistan compare these days. And cronyism is definitely one area where they look almost identical in places. So anyway, all kinds of different sectors of the economy started to come under the family control. And in the past, it would have been someone that was Niazov's crony. So it, it, it was a... A slightly better, more equal distribution of wealth, I suppose you could say. The money is there. The government just isn't willing to spend it because the Berdy Mukhameda family would rather keep it for themselves and spend it on fancy watches, which we see some of the cousins of the current president wearing. And they own all these different stores. And supposedly they own the black market currency exchange. So they're manipulating that. The list goes on and on here. So that's really one of the reasons why it's worse. Niazov was crazy by the end. I mean, they, who renames the days of the week and the months of the year and, and makes one of the months of the year named after his mother? That's kind of a, a new level of crazy. So Niazov, the country's first leader, the one whose book of poems becomes the book that the country's driving tests are based off of, suddenly dies in 2006, and a fairly unknown bureaucrat, Garanguli Burdi Mohamedov, becomes the president of Turkmenistan. He then goes on to rule until March 2022, where he hands power over to his son, Sadar Berdi Mohamedov, to which less than a year later, he would undercut his son and seize power back for himself by creating a role that, whilst not officially president, contains all the roles and responsibilities and powers of the president. So can you take us through what is actually going on here in Turkmenistan between the father and the son, and why he would make all this effort to pass the power on to his son to seize it back less than a year later? Gurban Guli Berdi Mohamedov is no longer the president, He's just the father of the president, but Gurban Guli does have the most power through this newly created post. You know, the whole thing with being on television and playing music and the piano and the guitar and going out to shoot automatic weapons and doing racing around in a dune buggy in the desert around the gates of hell, that big open pit gas crater that's been on fire for 50 years. That was already kind of weird. His son so far doesn't seem to have that kind of quality, which is good. He's much more quiet and reserved, and you don't see him acting like an idiot on TV so far yet, anyway. It's kind of bizarre, because it looked like this was going to be a new model for transition, but also overseen, so the, the father would manage the son and keep an eye on him as he got more experience and kept up the family legacy or the family business and protected the family business interests, I suppose. Okay, so his son becomes president, and then it lasts not even a year before they have to start reworking the constitution so that the father once again wields the ultimate power. There's a lot of different theories about why that happened. I think personally that it was just because Serdar just wasn't ready to be president and his dad sensed that. I mean, it was a strange time to change presidents. They were already going to do the election in March 2022 anyway. What, what they couldn't have figured on or included into their calculations was the fact that Russia would invade Ukraine, right? And this would be like a big disruptive effect that rippled out across and certainly through Central Asia. So the nature of foreign affairs changed in Central Asia really quickly and in Turkmenistan too. Turkmenistan's called themselves neutral, they've been isolationists, but they had to come out of their shell for this one because their partner, Russia, was suffering some serious setbacks. And there was a lot of questions about what would be the future of Turkmen-Russian ties, and would Russia be able to continue fulfilling the role it had in Turkmenistan, especially recently when it's actually, there's been warming ties between the two countries. So you have this fierce and, and furious foreign policy activity going on, where all of a sudden the president of Turkmenistan is meeting with the Turkish leader, the Azerbaijani leader, 
you know, the neighboring, the leaders of the neighboring countries, China, you know, on and on. And because he's, you know, Sardar is now the head of state, so he's supposed to be meeting with all these people. And there's a lot of important decisions being talked about. So I think Gurban Guli just finally figured that this is a bad time for a novice to be running the country because a lot of things are happening around this and the future course of the country is being reset right now. And they got to figure out what they're going to do and make the right decisions and leaving it to a, a, an inexperienced 41 year old that was just like, you know, fast tracked and groomed to the top and, and within just a few years really didn't have any political experience. So I think his father just figured this was a bad time for him to be actually calling the shots on what was going on in the country. And that while that he, Gurban Guli still could have done that behind the scenes, for some reason he figured that he needed the legitimation of some official title. So he actually got two, the leader of the country, and at the same time he's formally the head of this, this Hulk Maslahati, which is something like the legislative branch and something like the executive branch at the same time. But in the meantime, he's the head of the country again. So who's actually in charge then? Is Saddam making his own decisions or is he going to meetings where everything has been pre-arranged or pre-negotiated beforehand by his father or other members of the Turkmen palace? There's a small circle of people who are very close to the president or the former president to both them, to that family. Obviously, they have some interests that they a lot of interests that they want to protect. I had mentioned the, the immediate relatives, right? The sisters, their husbands and, and their offspring. Who are also doing quite well. So this is one thing that the clan, you know, I've heard those stories too. The clans that are related to either Berdi Mukhamed, Serdar Berdi Mukhamed's mother or the father also have a lot of influence. And this is kind of an interesting point because Serdar Berdi Mukhamed kind of brought his mother out of hiding. He had made public mention of her and then has been actually talking a lot about her. She got some kind of award last year and then he just mentioned her again. And, and there was, she came out in public and they had photos of her, which didn't happen when the father was there. He hardly ever saw his wife. So that also kind of tends to show that that side, that clan that's related to that family has, has got some kind of clout within there too. So that's all right. So this is another party that's got that's got something going on. And whoever's been giving the advice that, that the president acts on, because it's clear in Gurban Guli, Berdy Mukhamedov's case, a, a dentist by training, that he makes these decisions publicly, but this is after somebody is explaining to him what he needs to do and why he needs to do it. So it raises a lot of questions. The competence of the president of Turkmenistan, I've always thought he was kind of a front man. But to get back to what happens right now, because it's interesting now that, of course, Gurban Guli Berdi Mukhamedov has disappeared from public view again, as he did several years ago. There's, there's sparked the rumors of his health. He went to Germany. We all know that he gets medical treatment there, and he hasn't really been seen since. He appeared in a, a video clip the other night, but I have heard that after a lot of people watched it several times, or several people watched it a lot of times, I should say, they concluded that it was it was spliced together. It was that it wasn't something that happened very recently. So he's been gone, right? So that in the meantime, that meant that Serdar went to Moscow on May 9th. It means that Serdar is going to Xi'an, China. So Gurban Guli was reasserting himself into the government, but his, his sudden disappearance, for whatever reason, has given his son an opportunity to step forward and do this. It would have been interesting to see what happened if Gurban Guli was still healthy, or, or for whatever reason, he's out of public eye right now. If he was able to fulfill his, the functions of his office, would he have gone to Moscow, and would he be the one going to Xi'an? Or would they still leave it to Serdar? But in fact, you know, like I said, there's no sign of Gurban Guli. And the, the fact is that his son is the one that's going to Moscow and, and Xi'an. The situation inside Turkmenistan is pretty dire, to say the least. And there's already an exodus of people trying to leave at the moment. It's even gotten bad enough that the Turkmen government has lobbied the Turkish government to end their visa-free regime for Turkmen citizens to try and make it harder for their own citizens to leave Turkmenistan. And there are wide-scale reports of young Turkmen's being pulled off of flights to prevent them leaving the country, even if they have approved visa stamps to go study abroad. But after reading report after report after report on this country, what I don't understand is why we haven't seen uprisings like we have in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan. Does the Turkmen state hold a North Korean style hold over the Turkmen people? Or are the security forces just really, really good at their job? Why do you think we haven't seen any wide scale uprisings across the country yet? I mean, this is a good point, because although they try to control the narrative and keep outside information from reaching Turkmenistan, you can't do that. 
not with the new technologies and everything. Not to mention that there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Turkmen, at least, that are outside the country working as migrant laborers in a lot of places like Turkey or Russia or something. But, you know, they call home and tell, talk about what's going on, the things that they don't report on Turkmen TV or the things that they reported on, but with a very different take than what you, the relatives are telling them is happening there. So the Turkmen people certainly are aware that this stuff is going on. The main factor for this, the uh, fear of the security services. Like I mentioned uh, at the start, they've been really effective in keeping control over the population. There's some advantages that play into their hands. The one that I would mention would be the fact that having traveled around Turkmenistan quite a bit in the old days, it's a long distance between urban centers. You know, in some countries, information can spread by word of mouth. Real, and if it's a compact or densely populated area or something, the word gets around and it can cause a lot of problems. But in Turkmenistan, there's distances between cities. If there's an outbreak of a problem, it's easy to establish a cordon around that area and, and block all the information from going from one place to another. So that helps them. But in the meantime, certainly they have the image, the Turkmen security of someone who will just arrest you. They can charge you with anything they want. Constitutionally, you're guaranteed legal protection. But I mean, it's so sad in Turkmenistan that there have been cases where the court-appointed lawyer for the defense has started his speech, his argument, by saying, you know, it's a disgrace for me to have to defend a person like this, but they're entitled to some legal representation, and that's why I'm here. How bad is that if you're the defendant at this point? As bad as it is, complaining could make it much worse really quickly. There's always the question of how much does the Turkmen president know about the real situation in Turkmenistan? Obviously, they have an idea that things are pretty bad and that they're making a profit off of it, but they might not have fully comprehend the depths of misery in that country at the moment. I've been surprised that this government has been able to keep itself in power as long as it has. I thought that there would have been some kind of revolution. And there were people that tried to get those together. But again, the security forces, you know, what are you going to do? So we'll see what Sirdar can do about how long he can keep this up. I suppose there's a lot of different red lines, so to speak, about how much people are willing to take before they just figure they have nothing left to lose at all and they might as well just try to revolt. If, if somebody was successful at starting a protest, It'd probably get pretty big pretty fast. If they could hold out for 24 or 48 hours and word could get around the country a little bit, that it could be a danger to the Turkmen government. But as it stands now, there's, there's no sign that there is any resistance, which is amazing. They surely need backing and support from outside patron states or groups just to keep the regime afloat. So which countries or groups are actually backing the Turkmen regime at the moment, helping them stay in this position? Turkmen government gets a lot of help in this, right? There's other governments that benefit from having the per- current president and the, and the former president of Turkmenistan in power. I mean, this is what they want stability and they want someone they can manipulate as they wish that has something that they want. The Chinese government, certainly, because Turkmenistan is the largest exporter of gas to China. Now, Russia's picking up, but the fact is that China buys more Turkmen gas than it buys. Russian gas or, or gas from Myanmar or any of those other places at the moment. So China wants the same government. Russia, of course, Russia wants the same government. Iran would probably prefer to have the same government in Turkmenistan. And this is, of course, another country that borders Turkmenistan. Just because of the incompetence of the government makes Turkmenistan no threat to Iran at all. So they probably prefer that too. And there's other people out there that would also have relations with the Turkmen government that they're benefiting from and they would prefer that this government stays in power. So, of course, they're supporting the Turkmen government. China with surveillance equipment, we know, but I mean, they're certainly getting moral support and maybe more from a lot of these governments too. So there's no sign that the Turkmen government will fold anytime soon, as unpopular as it is. It's only one measure, and it only tells us a small amount of facts. But looking at the Freedom Index, Kazakhstan is slightly ticking up, and Takayev seems to be beginning to nudge the country in the right direction. But the pace of change is slow, and no one can be sure Takayev won't revert back to his predecessor's heavy-handed ways if we see another uprising in Kazakhstan. In Kyrgyzstan, another leader continues to play out the tale of Icarus, with multiple of the nation's presidents now coming to power, seizing too much control for themselves from the people, flying too close to the sun, and eventually, they all come crashing back down to earth. 
but how much longer does Chapartov actually have? Or can he secure enough support from certain pockets of society to stave off the same fate as the previous presidents who strolled down this path? Moving to our third, and the only other one of these five to see a slight uptick on the Freedom Index, Uzbekistan finds itself in an increasingly precarious position, as it looks at the instability of its northern neighbours and the solidifying dictatorships to its south, and tries to carefully steer its ship between the two. And add to that sanctions pressure, the flood of Russian migrants coming in and wrecking the local real estate markets, and much of the country's infrastructure still largely having been built during the USSR, and you have the recipe for disaster. But if the country can't navigate between these rocks, is it more likely to join its southern neighbours in its past, returning to a Karimov-style dictatorship, or would it steer towards reforms like in its northern ones? With Merzioyev relinquishing many of the controls and political levers it currently possesses. Moving to our fourth, Tajikistan also has a tough road ahead for themselves, and the leadership is likely aware that they need to start the transition now, whilst the sun is shining and things can be done smoothly, rather than waiting for Rahman to have a heart attack and a free-for-all power vacuum forming in his wake. But who will Rahman anoint as his successor, if he doesn't fully trust either his son or his daughter? You're starting to see it in report after report that the Tajik people are getting increasingly restless after 30 years of Rahman, and he can likely feel it too. But after watching the botched transition in Turkmenistan, I'm sure he'll be laying awake at night, wondering what the best path forward is. And lastly, the fifth of the five, Turkmenistan, the nation seemingly there to make everyone else look better. And there's not much I could say about Turkmenistan that hasn't already been said throughout this piece or all others where we mention the country. So far, the balloon of tensions just seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the country. And people have been waiting a long time for the pop to come. But so far, the balloon still has room to grow. My only small hope is that when it does go pop, the bang is loud enough for the world to finally pay attention to the Central Asian region. Thank you so much for everybody who tuned into the show this week. Everyone who knows me personally knows how much I love to talk about Central Asia and analyze the Central Asian region. I find it an absolutely fascinating area of the world, and I hope this crash course here sparks your interest in the region as well. Now, obviously, this episode just looked at the internal politics of the region and not the major actors or players or outside economic influences that are currently orienting the decisions of these countries. For that, we have entire episodes dedicated to Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, the Caspian Sea, the CSTO, and even Turkey's influence in the Central Asian region. And I highly recommend you check out those as well if you're interested in learning more about Central Asia. And if you want to be kept further up to date with all things Central Asia, as well as what's going on in the rest of the world, where we post all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter, where I'm on the handle at Mike Elliot Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help myself and the team keep this show going. And speaking of amazing Patreons, this week I'd like to thank Nola Nowland and Kawari, with the latest patrons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of our listeners like these guys who donate to help us keep this show going. So to all of you, I give a massive thanks and let you know that this episode focusing on democracy in Central Asia is all thanks to you. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Dictators Without Borders by this week's guest, Alexander Cooley, for a fantastic insight into the regional dictatorships, how they form and how they secure their power. The second is Sinostam by friend of the show, Raphael Pantucci, for a look at China's growing influence throughout the region. And the third is The New Silk Roads, by friend of the show, Peter Frankopan, for a look at how historical factors have shaped the modern day politics of the region. I also want to give a thanks to this week's guests, Alexander Cooley, Erika Barat, Timur Amarov, Steve Swerdlow, and Bruce Panier. For Central Asia analysts, this was practically my version of Woodstock, and I can't thank each and every one of these guys for jumping on this week. I also want to thank my staff, Wade McCarr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniel Zavella, Genevieve Donald and May, Nate Ostilla, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Rahul Devayarayanan, our OSINT analyst, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voice of our artist, Derek Henry Flood, our deputy editor, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Ross Crabtree, our media advisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Munch, our field correspondent. I love almost nothing more than working with this team, 
And it's even better when I get to work with them on an episode about Central Asia. The Red Line will be back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.